kind introduction. Hi, good morning. Yeah, we're going to be shifting gears a little bit uh, now, talking about um, chemistry and synthesis. Um, I'd like to discuss a little bit what we do in the lab, which is focused on the synthesis of nucleic acid libraries. And we synthesize them as microarrays. And uh, we use them for a wide variety of applications. But for this talk, I'll focus on the fact that we make many different nucleic acid sequences to study hybridization behavior, binding behavior, and also um, enzymatic recognition. Uh, right, so as I said, those microarrays that we make, we use them for very many different um, projects. Most of them are focused on the synthesis of something else than just DNA. So we can synthesize RNA microarrays. We can synthesize um, chemically modified um, nucleic acids. Uh, but we also have some more outlandish applications where we use those nucleic acid libraries for data storage, uh, but also for things like surface patterning, so basically DNA painting. Right, so as I was saying, we make these nucleic acid libraries as microarrays, so short introduction on what microarrays are and what kind of microarrays we do. Microarrays are collections of molecules, usually DNA, uh, on the same surface, usually glass, and there are typically two ways you can make microarrays. Either you have a pre-synthesized DNA, which you're going to manually immobilize on the surface, or you actually directly synthesize those um, uh, nucleic acids on the surface, which is what we do. Now, the amount of DNA that you can synthesize uh, that way uh, is kind of limited by the resolution of your apparatus. In our case, uh, our resolution is 1,024 times 768, which is a little bit under 800,000 different spots uh, on the surface, which means that's the total number of different sequences we can make uh, in one go. Uh, for DNA, we can make sequences up to about 100 nucleotides. For RNA, up to about 50 nucleotides. And each of those features contain the same sequence, and we estimate that we will have about 100,000 up to about a million of the same molecule, in this case, the same sequence per feature. So how do we uh, actually control where uh, we synthesize those uh, sequences? Well, we use photolithography, so we use actually UV light. So it's not, um, this is UVA, so this is 365 nanometer. And the way we control where the synthesis is going to take place uh, uses this small device called the digital micromere device, so DMD uh, in short. It's basically an array of very tiny mirrors, about 14 microns in size, and they're all electronically uh, addressable at the same time. They can be actually tilted in just two positions, which we call on and off. And depending on how they're tilted, on or off, it's going to be reflecting UV light onto the surface of your microarray or away from it. Your UV light is going to be produced. In our case, this is an LED source. And depending on whether you have an on or off mirror, you're going to have the corresponding small 14 micron size section on the glass illuminated or not. So schematically, it's going to look like this. Imagine that you have some of these mirrors turned on, means that the corresponding small section on the glass will uh, be illuminated by UV. You could decide that the neighboring micro mirror will be turned off, meaning that the neighboring spot on the glass will not be illuminated. And that illumination is basically going to be doing photochemistry, deblocking, basically deprotecting, so that the next step, which is the introduction of your common phosphoramidite, is only going to be reacting to those positions which had been previously illuminated. And in the next step, you could decide to have a totally different pattern of on and off mirrors so that other uh, spots are going to be illuminated so that the next phosphoramidite will be coupling to some other positions. And that's how you actually control um, the synthesis of your many different sequences at the same time. The chemistry itself is basically the same as solid phase synthesis, except instead of having your traditional acid mediated deblocking of the five prime with the DMT, we have a photosensitive protecting group on the five prime. But the rest of the synthesis is pretty much the same. We have a coupling of an actual phosphoramidite. We have um, an oxidation as well of your typical phosphite triester. We have a final deprotection 
just like in site phase synthesis, except you need to keep your DNA on the surface. You don't want to cleave it from your solid support, obviously. Yep. All right. That's a, a schematic of our uh, optical system. Uh, we used to have a mercury lamp to produce UV. Now we have, uh, well, we're in the 21st century. Uh, so we moved on to an LED. Uh, we have a light pipe, light pipe mirrors, lenses, basically just used to focus UV and to image a pattern of on and off mirrors onto our reaction chamber. And our reaction chamber is actually two microscope slides, meaning that we actually make two microarrays per run and they're identical to each other. Actually, there are mirror images of each other. <clears throat> so that at the end of the day, in that small surface, which is actually not that much bigger than my fingernail, we can end up having about 786,000 different uh, nucleic acid sequences, and we know exactly where or what sequence is actually hidden in that small spot. So let me move on to some of the uh, recent work we're doing with, with microarrays, where we don't just do DNA, we also synthesize in situ on those surfaces. Uh, chemical modification. I'm going to be focusing on about uh, uh, FANA for, for this talk. So FANA uh, is an analog of uh, Arabinos where your 2' hydroxyl has been replaced by 2' furine. It's a DNA mimic that increases binding affinity towards DNA uh, and RNA. It's heavily investigated in anti-sense and anti-RNA strategies. The triphosphates uh, of FANA can be recognized by some polymerases which makes it interesting in aptamer research. So we started working with uh, FANA on that uh, same topic. We looked at this particular uh, structure, which is a small G quadruplex, um, just made up of 15 nucleotide, which is known to bind to human thrombin and actually inhibit the activity of this protein uh, with a KD of about 100 nanometer. And we thought, can we actually find a particular G quadruplex containing final modification that would increase the binding to, uh, to, to thrombin? So that means that if we want to have the entire um, modification landscape, we would need to be doing all the possible permutation of, I didn't mention this, but that G quadruplex is just made up of T and Gs, but basically we would just have to change all of these T's into FANA T, all of these G's into FANA G, and the amount of possible permutation is at the end of the day, two to the power of 15, which is 32,000 different sequences, and we can synthesize them all in a single run on the same surface with multiple replicates of each sequence, uh, again, on the same microarray. And then at the end, we just do a single binding assay with fluorescent thrombin, and we get then the entire binding landscape, basically. That's just here in small excerpt of the microarray scan. You can hopefully see that there are differences in brightness, right? There's differences in fluorescence, and that's telling us about the strength um, of the binding. We can start looking manually at the data to try to figure out how specific introduction of finite specific position affects the actual binding affinity. Um, for instance, we have our control uh, so unmodified full DNA aptamer, we have its uh, corresponding fluorescence basically, and we decide that whatever is brighter than that must be a stronger binder into thrombin. We figured that anything that would contain a single final modification in those positions would have actually increased the binding. Single final modification in those positions would have decreased the binding because you have decrease in fluorescence. We can look at double modification as well to see how some of them would actually be uh, compensated by the introduction of another one. But we can also decide to try to find some pattern of um, finite DNA modification in the ranges of fluorescence you're interested in. So for instance, high fluorescence, which would mean strong binding to, to thrombin. Uh, if we look at that particular subset of data and try to extract motifs, basically, we would find that uh, in that area, position 1, 5, 10, and 14, these Gs are almost exclusively found modified as DNA, meaning that you cannot put FANA there um, unless you want to actually reduce the fluorescence intensity. That's basically because these Gs are actually uh, syn-oriented in the G quartet, and they don't actually accept uh, the introduction of a fluorine atom on a 2 prime. 
On the other hand, position three uh, is actually almost always found modified with FANA um, in the high fluorescence range. And we can um, monitor the increase of fluorescence across a concentration of thrombin to try to detect or measure dissociation constant. This is how we were able to find some sequences that just contain a few FANA modification, three and here four, uh, with KDs that are a little bit under 30 nanomolar compared to the original quadruplex, which was about uh, yeah, 100 nanomolar. Then we were interested in um, studying FANA in an uh, anti-sense context, because um, we know that the introduction of FANA roughly increases the TM by about 0.3 to about two degrees per modification. It's also one of the very few chemical mods that will still elicit RNAsH cleavage of the corresponding, well, the target RNA, although not as strong as DNA. And so we were wondering if there was a way to try to find an optimal mix of DNA and FANA in a particular anti-sense sequence that would, good, that would give good hybridization behavior as well as optimal RNAsH activity. Uh, but again, that would require making an entire combinatorial scape to be able to understand the entire story. So we started working uh, on this particular sequence, which is just 18 nucleotides long. It actually targets uh, the Luciferis um, mRNA. Uh, so some work has been done in the past, so we know where we are, at least at the small scale level. And we thought, okay, uh, can we actually do the entire permutation landscape once again of DNA into FANA? So in this case, if you start with an 18 mer oligonucleotide, you have two to the power of 18 different sequences. Uh, so that ends up being 262,000 different oligos, which again, we can synthesize uh, on the same microarray in the single synthesis. And that synthesis does not take that much more time than a traditional uh, single oligonucleotide synthesis per solid phase. So that's the concept. We have here just one example of a particular combination of FANA and DNA in that 18 mer, but basically then you end up having the entire story uh, on the same surface. And then you have a single hybridization assay, basically, with the same RNA complement uh, fluorescently labeled. And that is then the entire scan. That's the entire, uh, basically, duplex formation of all your 262,000 sequences. You can start zooming in and zooming in and zooming in, and then you start seeing all of these different spots, and each of those contain a single sequence, and you can hopefully see that there are differences in fluorescence telling us about the strength of duplex formation, basically. And if we try to sort of plot that range of fluorescence, it's going to take a sigmoidal shape, um, obviously with strong fluorescence here telling us about uh, strong duplex formation with the complementary RNA, low fluorescence meaning, well, low binding to RNA. Uh, and by following the increase of fluorescence, we can also try to uh, monitor the increase of FANA content, basically. So this is what we did. We looked at here uh, on the right-hand side at the low range of fluorescence. And we see that on average in that range of fluorescence, we have about 35% um, FANA in our 18 mer. And as expected, we sort of go up in terms of FANA content as we go up in fluorescence but we end up only about 60% uh, FANA at the end. So this is not a linear increase from 0% FANA to 100%. Like it's not that the full DNA sequence would actually have given us the lowest fluorescence and the 100% FANA would have given us the highest, right? So it, it seems to be a little bit more complicated than that. So we tried to use the entire data um, from all of these 262,000 different hybridization um, events and do feature selection to understand whether there are some actual places, positions that seem to be sensitive to the introduction of FANA. And indeed, we see that. For instance, we see this position here, uh, position 16, actually. So it's this particular C. Here is telling us that if it is going to be transformed into FANA, it's going to have a huge increase in fluorescence intensity meaning that this is going to be very positive for hybridization behavior. But interestingly, the nucleotide directly five prime to it 
this T here has almost no influence on the hybridization efficiency if you're going to be introducing FANA at that particular position. So it seems like there's also a position dependence on the introduction of that particular chemical mod. It's not just one or two degrees uh, per base pair. It's a little bit more complicated than that. For instance, we can start looking at the data a little bit more manually, like for instance, what happens to the hybridization signal when we start adding FANA stepwise, let's say from the five prime end or for the three prime end, can we try to monitor this and see how it looks? That would be the sort of the two curves, five prime to three prime conversion stepwise, three prime to five prime conversion stepwise. We see that overall it does increase, which again correlates well with the story that the more FANA you have, you increase your hybridization efficiency. But clearly you can see that this is not a linear increase, right? We have bumps and troughs. For instance, there's one thing that we can clearly see uh, in the two cases, whether we introduce final stepwise from five prime or final stepwise from three prime is that once we are at this uh, C16 position, uh, the introduction of the next FANA at that position, so C16, or from the other hand over here, there is always going to be a big increase in fluorescence intensity. So that correlates very well with our feature selection. Um, actually here also single FANA incorporation at one of the different 18 positions. What happens to that? Again, here we have our C16 position, big increase, and our T15 just immediately five prime to it actually decrease the fluorescence intensity. And if we try to, once again, just like for the uh, quadruplex uh, story, try to see whether there's some sort of a pattern of FANA and DNA in terms of mix in the two ends of the sigmoidal uh, curve. So again, high fluorescence, meaning strong duplex formation, low fluorescence, low melting temperature, presumably. If we try to find whether there is some sort of pattern here, this is what we see, again, per position um, in terms of FANA and DNA content per position. We clearly see that positions 16 and 17 are almost always found modified as FANA in that particular part um, of the curve. Um, T15, once again, seems to be almost 60% of the time, 70% of the time found with FANA. So really the introduction of FANA there is going to be detrimental to hybridization efficiency. And obviously that's going to look the other way around when we look at the uh, other tail uh, of the curve, meaning here, at the low end of fluorescence position, 16 and 17 are almost always, and certainly for C16, I think that's the truth, always found uh, with just purely DNA. So right now we are trying to do RNAsH um, assays on those duplexes to see whether there is some correlation between hybridization intensity and RNAsH activity and see whether there is a way to actually perhaps identify one of a candidate here that would give high hybridization and also pretty good RNAsH activity. And let me move on to the second part of my talk when I'm gonna be focusing on the in situ RNA synthesis um, and the synthesis of RNA microarrays and how we use that to uh, understand enzymatic recognition. So to do RNA synthesis, with phosphoramylate chemistry, but still as microarrays, we can't use the normal silyl protected RNA phosphoramylates because we use glass. So the deprotection of your two prime is going to affect your glass uh, at the same time. So we had to come up with a new set of RNA phosphoramylate that would be uh, compatible with photolithography. So we came up with those where on the two prime, we have an acetyl ester type of protection these are base sensitive, so it works well with our base T protection at the end for DNA and for RNA. Uh, obviously, they are photoprotected, so that's a sort of um, a protecting group we use, which are photosensitive, typical NPPOC. We're also working on derivatives of NPPOC, which are 10 to 12 times more sensitive to UV, but that's our basic um, um, workhorse, let's say, of um, micro photolithography, the, the NPPOC. So they work well, they couple very well. And importantly, we can also synthesize DNA and RNA at the same time. So that was one of the very first tests we did where we synthesized the same sequence in DNA and RNA format. 
and we check that we can hybridize to both. Uh, and in this case, we use just the same target, basically, to either the DNA or the RNA version of the same sequence. We get pretty much similar hybridization efficiency. That's the sort of uh, data you would see here. Um, and to verify that we're actually synthesizing RNA, we can just do a simple RNAsH test, which would um, degrade your RNA here. And that's exactly what you see. You see some spots disappearing, uh, meaning that those were the ones which were synthesized as RNA. And the other ones uh, remaining are the DNA uh, version of the same sequence. So if density we can make is the same as DNA, basically. So uh, that's one example here where we synthesized, I think it is a 30 mer. Uh, we decided to do like um, a variable region where we changed um, in these nine nucleotide long section um, every possible basis and just to understand the sequence specificity basically of our RNA oligonucleotides. That's a sort of range of fluorescence we can, we can see. Um, and yeah, at the end of the day, this is in terms of density. So that's going to be the same uh, as DNA. So pretty much close to 800,000 different sequences we can make. And the fact that we can synthesize both DNA and RNA at the same time uh, made us um, contemplate how some enzymes, which can recognize the presence of RNA into DNA, how some of these enzymes can perhaps um, process some substrates better than others. We started working with uh, RNAs H2, which is an enzyme that is, has evolved to recognize misincorporated RNA in DNA, which is something that happens all the time during, um, during DNA replication. You'd think that such an enzyme would have probably evolved to recognize any type of RNA, right? Um, sequence independent, but we still ask the questions. So to do that, to try to understand whether some sequences are actually better substrates uh, than others, we did um, libraries of hairpins. So that's one particular example here. This is a hairpin that has um, nine base pair type of stem. And that middle section here has five base pairs and we did all possible permutations here, uh, all possible base pairs in this case as well as all possible single RNA introduction, but also consecutive RNA incorporation up to five. See whether there is also some differences depending on how many RNA inserts you have. Um, and we did also test with uh, the introduction of mismatches to see basically what happens, um, which mismatches are going to make it even harder for the enzyme to, to cleave. And the way we can actually monitor the, the cleavage is we actually put a dye at the five prime end of our hairpin. Um, and we basically then after a single assay, right? Uh, same as for the uh, thrombin and for the, um, the hybridization project, a single assay with RNAsH would give us this sort of uh, data where we can just monitor basically the loss of fluorescence and the loss of fluorescence will tell us about the efficiency of cleavage. And we do indeed find that there is sequence preference. That's what we see. Let's start with the simplest case. So a single RNA incorporation. We know where the cleavage is happening. So it's gonna be five prime to the RNA inserts. And in um, the subset of sequences that were the best cleaves, so meaning the biggest loss of fluorescence, if we try to understand whether there's a pattern, yes, there is a pattern we find that in those better cleaved um, uh, substrates, there seems to be almost, well, most of the time uh, a C, just five prime to the cleavage site. So that would be DNA here, would be this one. Um, and um, RA as the RNA inserts. That motif would be found um, in the better cleaved substrate. And this is a motif that we see even when we start adding consecutive RNA incorporations where we also know where the cleavage would take place when you have multiple RNA incorporations. And in this case too, we see that this CA pattern shows up all the time. Even though here in this case, the cleavage would be between two RNA inserts, we still see this C and this A pattern. And interestingly, this is a pattern that was found also for RNAs H, conventional RNAs H by a group that has nothing to do with what we do, but they still looked at the sequence preference of RNAsH and they found this CAA, I think it is a trinucleotide motif 
um, that was um, telling about the efficiency of our NSH cleavage. It was working best on the CAA motif. And then we studied a little bit about mismatches, right? To understand which position and which type of mismatches are going to affect the cleavage efficiency. So basically we're gonna be discussing um, in terms of um, color here, the redder the color, the, the worse the cleavage efficiency basically by the introduction of this mismatch. So we took two hairpin models, these two, and we just basically did all the possible mismatches, those positions, and we can then map the entire thing. And we can obviously understand that it is at the position minus one and position zero, basically where the cleavage is going to take place, that the presence of the mismatch is going to be the most detrimental to um, cleavage efficiency, especially uh, the presence of an AG type of mismatch here at the position minus one is going to be the one that affects the cleavage efficiency the most. I think it does reduce it by about 80% or so. Right, so that's gonna be the, the end of my talk. Uh, I'd like to thank Professor Somosa, as well as PhD and the postdocs working in my group, especially Erika Schaudi and Igor Illich, uh, my collaborators at the University of Montpellier, uh, Masadama at McGill as well, and the Austrian Science Fund for funding this research, as well as you, physical and digital, digital people for listening to me.